Hello everyone, welcome to another episode of the audiobook series. I'm your host, Gabriel Garcia, always known as the Wandering Scribe and the Wandering Quill, and today we continue the world of Aminus, son of Persia. Now where we last left off, a lot of things have changed. Artabanus has been revealed to be a traitor and a co-conspirator in a plot to overthrow Xerxes the king. Xerxes, unfortunately, has been assassinated by Artabanus, and now Artabanus has taken the reins, solidifying his rule as the new king of Persia. All the while, Sparta is reeling from the loss of losing one of its most beloved Spartans, Aminus Baru, as well as the Persian prince Artaxerxes. Six years have gone by, and the duo are now living in Carthage under the care of their masters, an Iberian couple, Dalinar and Iserdin. However, something has come up. A familiar stone has made its way into Carthage, and it's bringing back memories, or rather visions, of a past long forgotten for Aminus. What does this all mean for him? Well, let's continue in chapter 9. Later that day, Aminus and Artaxerxes spent the rest of the afternoon exploring the port city. The Iberian couple gave them some money to spend in the local shops. In their sixth year of exile, the pair managed to form good relations with the locals. They were surprised how many spoke Persian and Greek. As they passed different shops, a shop owner got their attention and remarked that the young man needed a new walking stick. Seems you require a new staff. Well, my friends, I have the finest walking sticks in Carthage. They also work as weapons for those uncertain times, said the shopkeeper. Aminus had to give the owner credit. The staff he presented were of the elite quality. He would have no use for such a thing, but... Perhaps the prince could use one. Is it all right if my friend examines them? said Aminus. The shop owner nodded his head. Artaxerxes placed the broken piece of wood on the ground and touched the different wood and metal types. As he neared the end of his selection, he caught a whiff of a familiar smell. He followed the scent to the front of the store. Taking a deep breath, he remarked of how the aroma had an aromatic sensation, making him calm. Placing his hands on the wood, he felt the center smoothness. As he ran his hands up and down, he felt the edges of gems, the coolness of metal, and the distinct outline and shape of a bird's head. What can you tell me about this one? said the prince. Young man, your possession is one of my most thought-out staffs. 172 centimeters of grand sandalwood, from the base of this incredible masterpiece. Playfully interweaving shafts touch to form the handle adorned with tiny gems for a firm grip. The bottom ends in a thick decorated cylinder made of obsidian and decorated with etchings to protect the wielder. The top is made of first rate wood and has been crafted into an eagle skull decorated with intricately painted patterns of Persian origins and said to be an ancient text with an unknown meaning. As the man had finished explaining the staff's features, Dr. Xerxes thought of how beautiful and powerful this item must be. He must have it. How much? asked the prince. The shopkeeper explained that the set price was usually 500 drachma. But today he felt generous and dropped the price to 300 drachma. Dr. Xerxes looked at Aminus. He wanted the staff, but the price was still high. The Spartan knew it as well. Sold, said Aminus. He and the shopkeeper the money, and they walked away with their prize. As they walked away, Octoxerxes marveled at how light it was to carry. Thank you, Aminus, said the prince. Spartan chuckled and continued on their walk. Just then, the prince's nose picked up another smell. Do you smell that? asked the prince. It smells like fire, finished the Spartan. They both run in the direction of the blacksmith's home. Oh no! The pair pushed past casual bystanders and soldiers and returned to their master's home. Once they arrived, they saw the house was engulfed in flames. People were throwing buckets of water at the burning building, trying to put it out. 
Ammonus looked for their master. They were not outside. I heard a voice coming from the house, yelled a bystander. Ammonus jerked his head at the house and heard voices from the inside. Stay here, he told the prince, jumping through the open window. He wrapped a cloth around his face to block out the smoke. Master, where are you? He coughed. The smoke was bad and limited his vision. It was starting to sting his eyes as well. As he moved forward, a piece of the burning debris almost fell before him. The house was beginning to cave in and would disintegrate at any moment. Moving through, a voice called out, Aminus, said a faint voice. He followed the sound and arrived at the master's room. When he reached the door, he saw several heavy boxes blocking the entranceway. Knowing he had a little time, he broke and smashed until the doorway was cleared. Grabbing the handle, he opened the door and saw his Saradin and Dalandar. We need to leave, shouted the Spartan. Grabbing their hands, he squirted them out of the burning house. Once outside, the Iberian couple coughed to remove the fumes from their lungs. As Dr. Xerxes tended to the couple, Aminus looked at the burning house. It's all gone, said the blacksmith. His face was still covered in ash and smoke, and his voice carried a singe of pain and sorrow. It is a great loss, my love, but we can rebuild again, said his wife. Thanks to the others' help, the fire was put out before it destroyed anything further. However, unfortunately, everything belonging to the Iberian couple was gone. All his tools, plans, charts, and measurements had been lost to the fire. He would have to start over, all over again. I am sorry for your loss, master, said Aminus. The blacksmith looked up at him melancholy. You're a free man now, Aminus. You and your friend. Our affairs are no longer your business, said the blacksmith. Correction, sir. It is our business. Someone robbed you and your wife of your livelihood. That cannot stand. Slave or not, we're going to help you. Had it not been for your kindness... Our lives would have been drastically different. Arxaxerxes agreed. You're a good man, said the blacksmith's wife. <sighs> Master, do you remember if anyone came into the store after we left? The blacksmith tried to think back a few hours ago. Just when you left, I was approached by a stranger, a hooded fellow. He spoke Persian and asked for my wares. What was he asking for? asked the prince. He wanted to buy the gemstone, but I told him it wasn't for sale. He offered me numerous drachma, but I turned him down still. He left angry. Was there anything on his person that you remembered? On his cloak was a pin, I think. It had two eagle wings with a man in the center. That's the royal symbol of Persia, said the prince. Only immortals have that insignia. This was bizarre. Why would a Persian immortal be doing this far west? And want a precious stone. Aminus had to get to the bottom of this. Do you still have the stone? The blacksmith opened his pouch on his belt, showing them that the stone was still intact. We need to find that arson, said Aminus. Spartan told the prince to stay with the couple as he looked for the mysterious individual. Asking around, he hoped someone saw the mysterious hooded figure. With his luck seeming to run out, he met a small child on the streets who said to have seen a strange man running towards the circular port stables. The Spartan thanked the child and ran after his target. Arriving at the stables, he looked around for the arson. He had to be cautious, though. He did not want his target to run off again. Looking around, he carefully observed his surroundings. He had to rely upon his Spartan training now more than ever. Moving past other civilians, he got a glimpse of his target. The hooded man was negotiating the prices for a horse. A perfect distraction, thought Aminus. As he neared his objective, Aminus knew he had to do this quickly. A few feet from his target, the hooded man turned around with a dagger aimed at the Spartan's chest. He grabbed his attacker and elbowed him in the face. It stunned him for a while, but the assailant recovered and slashed in the air, trying to cut Aminus. He moved out of the way of the vicious attacks and found himself inside a horse stable, with the horse as his only protection from the Persian. Aminus got an idea. Before the Persian could react, Aminus slapped the horse as we were shocking the animal. The horse immediately kicked his back legs, hitting the man dead in the face. 
killing him instantly. With the man dead, Amnus left the stables and approached the dead body. He rummaged all over the Persian until he came across a papyrus of ancient origins. Amnus could only read parts of it, but the language was too old to understand. Hearing the soldiers come, he left the area. Arriving back, he showed the prince and the couple what he had found. He explained that the ancient tablet was of Greek origins, but he could not decipher its meaning. I think I may have a solution for that, said the blacksmith. He stated that he had been communicating with a Greek living on Sicily's island in Syracuse for a while. Perhaps this individual may be able to help them. With no other alternative, Amnes Artaxerxes, with Dalandar and Aceridan, charter a boat to Syracuse, taking only their remaining belongings. Syracuse, Sicily, 476 BC. Arriving at Syracuse the next day, Amnes asked the blacksmith where his Greek friend lived. The blacksmith said his friend lived in the very heart of the city. Tying their boat to the docks, they entered the mighty city. Though Syracuse was not Sparta, seeing Greek architecture and familiar people was a lovely sight to see. Amnes was happy to be amongst Greek people again. It made him feel like home. After a while, they arrived at a small house near the edge of the city's limits, away from the hustle and bustle. The blacksmith knocked on the door. Who is it? said a gruff voice. It's me, the Iberian. I need your help, he said. Go away. I already gave you the maps for Hispania. That voice couldn't be, said Amnes to himself. When we passed the blacksmith, he knocked on the door louder. Go away, shouted the voice. Open up, said the Spartan. Why should I, replied the voice. Because the Spartan dog says so. No reply came back. Instead, Amnes heard the door opening. As the door opened before them, the house owner greeted Amnes and the company. He had a clean face with a thick curly hair, eyes as sharp as a bird, and a blue cloak with an symbol of an owl. Greetings, Themistocles. It's been a long time. Your cipher sore eyes, said the former Athenian general. He led them inside and offered them some wine. They each took a glass and drank. Sitting on the floor, he asked his friends where they had come. We need your help, said Aminus. The Athenian chuckled and took another sip of wine. Why should I help you? It is because of you that Greece fell to the Persians. Everything we fought for at Marathon prior meant nothing. Now Greece is in a state of a civil war, said the Athenian. Civil war? What are you talking about? Themistocles put down his cup and looked at the Spartan. You mean you don't know? Athenian, we've been living in Carthage for six years as slaves. We don't know what's happening back home, to the prince. But you're supposed to be... Bastard lied to them, he said to himself. Aminus finished his drink and looked directly at the Athenian. Look, I know you hate me for what we did, but right now we need your help. We may not have been on the same side as before, but now we can change that. We both miss home, and we both want to save her. Please help us, if not for us, then for the memory of Athens, said Aminus. Zemisticles thought long and hard about the Spartan and had said, They were enemies in the past, true, but that was six years ago. Times have changed. People can change. Letting out a deep breath, he looked at the young Spartan. You're a brave fool, I'll give you that. Fine, I'll help you. Aminus headed the Athenian, the papyrus. Where did you get this? From the body of a dead immortal. He wanted the stone. What stone? The blacksmith showed the Athenian the precious stone. The old man's eyes widened with awe and shock. Do you know what this is? No. Do you know of it? Asked Dr. Sixties. You have no idea what you've stumbled upon. He replied. Enlighten us, said the blacksmith. The Athenian general explained that they had an ensignite in their possession. Also known as a star sapphire, these gems were in decent demand. But they're a scarce gemstone species. According to ancient stories, these gems contain life properties, making them a significant offensive weapon enhancement. That doesn't sound good, said the prince. You said a hooded immortal wanted the stone? Do you have his pin? Amnes pulled it out of his pocket and tossed it to Themistocles. Just as I thought, your arsenal belongs to the guild of the Craven Eagle. 
a sacred and ancient Persian elite society composed of religious zealots. And why would this society want this stone? Themistocles explained that according to the papyrus, the society wanted to recreate an ancient Mycenaean weapon called the Phoenix. Who are these Mycenaeans? Asked Artaxerxes. Amnes explained to the prince that they were an ancient group of Greeks that existed long before creating the first city-states. In their prime, they were the most powerful in the region. What else does the tablet say? It says that during the Trojan War, King Agamemnon ordered the creation of a powerful weapon called the Phoenix. The weapon was said to have used a star sapphire to harness the power of the sun's light and burn anything that stood in its way, even stone. However, many argued <clears throat> and they favored a more conventional weapon, the Trojan horse. <laughs> Fearing that the weapon may fall into the wrong hands, Agamemnon separated the stone from the weapon. After that, there's nothing else. Does the tablet offer any descriptions of this weapon? Some vague references of aromatic wood and a bird's head? Aromatic wood, said Aminus. Our head of a bird, said Dr. Xerxes. To figure it out and look back at the staff. You don't think that, said the prince, that you have the most dangerous Greek weapon ever made? Yes, I do. Everyone in the room was silent. This changes everything, said Themistocles. Themistocles, you said that Greece was embroiled in a civil war? What did you mean by that? As a Spartan. Boy, you best sit down. This is going to be a long story, said the Mystic Beast. Chapter 10. Upon learning the history of the Phoenix, the Mystic Leaf explained the troubles on the home front. After the massacre in Macedonia, a civil war broke out between Leonidas and Alexander I. To make matters worse, Macedonia has the full support of the Persian government. Why has my father allowed his enemy to become his ally? I'm sorry to say this, young prince, but your father is dead, said Themistocles. There was a loud gasp. Official accounts deem the death a cause of a broken heart, while others believe it to be an assassination. Many suspected Artabanus had a hand in this. To make matters worse, there are even revolts in Egypt, leading to a strong division of the empire between followers of Artabanus and loyalists to your father. Why such a division, said Aminus, submissively so stated the audience. Since the prince died, and Xerxes had no other heir, the only person left to rule was Artabanus, who has now gone and undone everything Xerxes' father worked hard to achieve. Things can't get any worse, said the Spartan. Unfortunately, the Athenian told the company one last piece of terrible news. He had heard that a Carthaginian fleet was planning to invade Greece very soon. We have to get back to Greece now, said Artaxerxes. Amnes stopped the prince. Hold, he said. Artaxerxes pushed his hand away. How can you sit there? My father is dead. Your country's in a state of war, and that bastard is sitting on my throne, yelled the prince. Amnes let out a sigh. I want him dead just as much as you do. But we need to be smart about this. We can't simply march into the capital of the Persian Empire by ourselves. Artabanus has the army and the zealots. We need an army of our own. Artaxerxes huffed in irritation, but deep down, he knew his bodyguard was right. What do you propose, then? asked the prince. Greece needs our attention, first and foremost. We need to sneak back into the region unseen and rally with my king and those fighting against Alexander. Hopefully we can meet the Carthaginian invasion before they arrive, exclaimed Aminus. Count us in, said the Iberian couple. Amnes and the prince looked at them in confusion. The blacksmiths interjected before either of them could say a word. From the look of things, you need every help you can get. And no one knows how to work metal better than me, said a Saradin. His wife also nodded in agreement. Amnes smiled and thanked them. Then it settled. Tomorrow we leave for Greece at first light. With all that settled, Themistocles told them they could spend the night here. Later in the evening, Themistocles entered his vineyard and grabbed a handful of grapes for tonight's dinner. Today's special was roasted fish and poultry with olives and figs, goat cheese, bread, and wine. The Greeks loved their wine. Back in the house, Aminus helped set the table. 
It's been a while since he's had Greek food. Dr. Jerkies was happy he tried different Greek food instead of the blood stew he once had back in Sparta. His Sarah and his wife also helped with the table by offering metal utensils instead of wood. The Mystic returned to the house and quickly worked on making the wine. Placing the grapes in a small cup, he grabbed a wooden tool and grounded them into paste. He repeated the process several times until the paste had reduced. He poured the juice into five drink vessels and set them on the table. With dinner all prepared, everyone gathered around the table. In Greek customs, the men ate first and the women ate afterwards, but this is not Greece. Aminus could taste the different spices after taking a bite of the chicken. Cumin, coriander, cinnamon, and pepper reminded the young Spartan of home. For the first time in six years, he smiled, a sincere smile. Looking around the table, he saw that everyone was enjoying themselves. You Athenians sure know how to cook with spices, said the prince, taking a piece of fish out of his mouth. Taking a piece of fish into his mouth. Seems those spices I sent you paid off, said Aserodim. It's been a while since I cooked a meal such as this. I usually don't have much company over, said Themistocles. Throughout the night, the Athenians started telling his guest tales of the Battle of Marathon, and how he came face to face with Darius I. I remember that story, said the prince. My father would tell me that story when I was a boy. Is it true that a runner died after running a marathon to report the news of the victory? That is correct, young man, said the Athenian. Amnus took a sip from his cup and began to tell tales of his own not wanting to be outdone by the Athenian. He spoke of the ancient rivalry between Athens and Sparta. And other stories, such as the Iliad and tales of the Trojan War. The rest of the night was spent with laughter and drinking. As the evening turned to night, the mystically told everyone they needed to get their rest if they wanted to leave early. Everyone took a spot and settled in for the night. Aminus was the last to fall asleep as his mind returned to those visions. They seemed clear and more accurate now, as if he lived them. But that was impossible, right? Closing his eyes, he slowly drifts off into sleep. No one should live under oppression. I think we will see home again. There is more going on here than you realize. We must win this. He betrayed us. Tyranny will die today. Lord Kairos. Well played, Richard. When someone returns to the exact moment they were summoned, history changes, creating an alternate timeline. We are the champions of Earth. Aminus! Yeah! yelled the Spartan as he awoke from another dream. This time the dreams were more prevalent than before. He looked around and saw that everyone was still asleep. Getting up from the floor, he walked out of the house and into the night sky. He gazed at the stars and wondered why these dreams plagued him. Because they're yours, said an unfamiliar voice. Aminus turned around but saw no one there. Suddenly, a man covered in a black robe was before him. His voice was soft, yet firm. The unknown stranger startled the young Spartan, who went to reach for a sword. Lower your hand, I mean you no harm, said the stranger. Aminus was so cautious, but something about this stranger seemed familiar. Who are you? asked the Spartan. An old friend, you can say, said the stranger, lowering his hand. He tried to get a glimpse of the man's face, but couldn't. The hood had covered most of it. I know of the dreams that plague you. They are memories from a forgotten place, of a forgotten time. I don't remember any of it, nor the people. And yet, they all seem so familiar, so real. What does it mean? In Thrace there is a temple. Inside lies a sword dubbed the Lion's Fang. It will answer all your questions and offer clarity. King of Nyron. King of Nyron? What are you talking about? Go to the temple, repeated the stranger as he faded away. Wait, how will I find this temple? asked Aminus. You will know. Trust your dreams, <laughs> said the stranger faintly as he vanished into the night. All alone, Aminus was left with more questions than answers. King of Nyron? Memories long forgotten? The lion's fang? What does this all mean? Aminus pondered the questions but knew he had to follow the stranger's instructions if he wanted answers. He had to trust his dreams. He had to go to Thrace. Chapter 11 
The following day, everyone got ready for the voyage. As Sarah and his wife gathered the belongings, Themistocles went to the docks to get a boat. As for Artaxerxes, he spent the morning looking for Aminus. When he woke up this morning, he was not in the house. As he searched for him, he saw his bodyguard near the stone wall overlooking the sea. He cautiously approached his friend. Aminus, what are you doing here? he asked. The Spartan did not look at him, but responded to his question. I had another vision. A dream. Last night. In that dream, I heard voices leading up to some battle. Then I met someone. Was it a zealot? If he and Artaxerxes, Aminus shook his head. No, he wasn't Persian. But I don't think he was human either. He spoke with a softness that sounded familiar. He said my dreams are memories lost. Memories of what? asked the prince. I cannot begin to explain what happened last night, but... He said that my answers would be found in Thrace. Thrace? Aminus, Thrace is Macedonian-controlled territory. We're walking into the lion's den, exclaimed the prince. Funny you say that. In Thrace, there's a temple. That temple houses a weapon, a sword, called the Lion's Fang. It's tied to my dreams. I know this all sounds crazy, but we have to go to Thrace first. Aminus looked at the prince with a dreaded face. Aminus, are you sure about this? Asked his friend with a concerned look. My prince, I need to do this. Until I figure out what all of this means, I'm useless to everybody, including you. Artaxerxes exhaled through his nose and th thought of the ocean. Doking all the sounds he heard, from the water splashing on the rocks to the call of seagulls. <sighs> Alright, we'll go to Thrace, to the prince. Do your dreams tell you where we need to go in Thrace? From what my dreams tell me, they all point to the port city of uh, Dikea. In that city, we'll find a temple. And with it, my answers. All right, I'll go tell the others about the change of plans. I'll see you at the docks. After she turns around and walked away from his friend. My prince, said Aminus. Hmm? Thank you, replied the Spartan with a smile. The Persian prince smiled back. As the prince left, Aminus was left to his thoughts once more. What? shouted Themistocles. After she finished explaining to the others, but the Athenian was upset and confused. What do you mean we're not going to Greece? shouted the Athenian once more. The prince tried to calm the older general. It's a minor detour. Aminus needs to go there and Semisocles cuts the Persian sword. I don't care if you need to go to Mount Olympus. I'm not going to Thrace. Yes, you are, said Aminus, who arrived at the docks in his regular attire. Semisocles raised an eyebrow at the young soldier. Oh, do tell, asked the Athenian, taunting the young soldier. Aminus was not intimidated by the Athenian, and continued talking. Do you think the zealots have not followed us here, or know that we have spoken with you? Face it, Athenian. You need us just as much as we need you. You can't live in hiding anymore. Sooner or later, others will find you, and they won't be of the friendly kind. Aminus and Minsky stared at each other eye to eye, both wanting to see what came first. Are you threatening me? asked Minsky. His hand slowly moved for his weapon. I don't make threats. I make promises. And I promise you, others will find you. It's only a matter of time. And when? Replied Aminus. His tone was calm, but had serious weight to it. After there, Jesus, Saradin, and Dalant are waiting to see what happened next. After a few minutes pass, the Athenian general concedes, knowing Aminus was right. Fine. We'll go to Thrace. But once you get what you need, we are going to Sparta at once. He said, All right then. Do we have everything we need? asked Aminus. We have enough supplies to last the trip. How far is Thrace from Sicily? asked Sardin. Between two to three days, maybe more, depending on the ocean's weather. If we leave now, the winds will be in our favor, said Themistocles. Aminus nodded his head. With everything ready, the small company boarded the boat and prepared to sail. Everyone took a bench and grabbed an oar. On Semisli's command, they began to move their oars. It would take all their strength to help propel the boat into the open waters. Once they were, they were bound to Thrace, with Sicily behind them. From here, there was no going 
back. Thresh, 473 BC. After three days of rough waters and fair winds, the small company arrived at the Dakia port in early afternoon. They docked their boat far enough away from wandering eyes. Before leaving the ship, they wrapped themselves in cloaks to hide their appearance. Once fully clothed, the company left their vessel. They were about to exit the docks until they were approached by two Macedonian hoplites. Underneath their cloaks, Aminus and Semisicles each gripped their swords. However, Artaxerxes stopped them and told them to wait. Suddenly, a Saradin walked toward two soldiers. Afternoon! What seems to be the problem, soldiers? One of the hoplites pointed his spear at the Iberian. State your business, asked one of the soldiers. My name is the Saradin. I'm a blacksmith from Cossage. My wife, Dalinar, and I have been traveling the Mediterranean, looking for materials and supplies to rebuild our shop back home. Why travel this far east? asked the other. Carthage does not necessarily have lumber. Thus, I need wood to rebuild my shop. Also, my tools were lost. Who travels with you? Asked the other hoplite, pointing to Aminus and the others. Those are our slaves, said Dalinar. They accompanied us on this journey. The two hoplites looked at each other and back at the company. Aminus' heart raised as he slowly unsheathed the sword. It stopped when another voice emerged. Let them through, said the voice. The command came from a Persian immortal, although this one was dressed differently. Instead of the traditional leather armor with iron scales, this immortal wore a bronze cuirass, known as a charina, or four mirrors in Persian. The cuirass consisted of a light breastplate, a backplate, and two side plates, all of which shaped to fit top of the warrior skilt uh, silk shirt. His arms were protected by bronze van braces covered in leather and decorated in gold and silver. The immortal held a bronze round shield in one hand, while in the other carried an all bronze battle axe with a sharp pick opposite of the crescent shaped blade. As for his helmet, they no longer wore the white hoods and face coverings. Instead, they wore metal helmets with spikes and nasty face coverings, almost that of skulls. This immortal wasn't like anything Aminus or the prince had seen in the past. But, sir, interjected one of the hoplites, the immortal glared at the soldiers. Let them through. The two Macedonians gulped and moved out of the way for a small company. The immortal bowed before the travelers. Welcome to Thrace, Iberium. I hope you have a more pleasant experience during your time here, he said, glaring at the two hoplites. Thank you, sir, said a sergeant. Amazon and friends left the docks and enter the situation and enter with the situation said Aminus did my ears deceive me was that man a Persian whispered after six days yes my lord not just any he was an immortal but his attire was, it was entirely different he belonged to the zealots said the mystic Lees. how can you tell Aminus said the Athenian pointed out that the immortal curus had the eagle's emblem signifying his allegiance to the guild as they walked further into the city, they noticed many soldiers. But these were not just any soldiers. Some were Carthaginians, others were Persian. They had to be. They had all had to be on their guard. All right, Spartan, where's the temple? Inquired Themistocles. Amnes closed his eyes and concentrated. He searched deep within his mind until his eyes reopened. It's outside the city. Follow me, said the Spartan. Following an old gold trail, they journeyed out of the city and into the woods, where they came across the ruins of an ancient temple. It was similar to the temples in Athens, but some statues did not resemble Greek gods. Instead, as one would say, they did not resemble the Greek gods as they are to be imagined. As they examined the ruins, they realized there was nothing there. All that surrounded them were marble pillars and broken statues. Well, this was a waste of time, says the Mythicles, as the Athenian ranted aloud, Arcturus approached his friend. <clears throat> Says Mr. Cleese. Could you have been you have mistaken, Aminus? Spartan was not listening to his friend. He was fixated on the ground that was etched with strange symbols. As he read them to himself, he discovered they were not symbols but words. Upon completion, it read, Otav ektor ni no to avitapi 
en yo petit y vac y toc, a exobnac tive iba teroc acto, epofic cae tive acto nacton tin sionoctia, sae ti epithic. What does it say? As Dr. Xerxes, when the moment comes that the lion returns, an eagle shall cause the end to enemies and the restoration of balance and peace. After reading the prophecy, the ground underneath him began to shake with a low rumble. Then, just before him, the floor moved away, revealing a secret set of stairs. Guys, look at this, said Aminus. Smithicles and the others turned around and saw the entrance leading down to the earth. Aminus told everyone to grab a torch from the stone pillars and follow him. Walking down the stairs, they saw pictures carved into the stone. They depicted seven warriors facing off against a cloaked man wielding a staff of some kind with a crescent. These records were of a battle no one knew of except for Aminus. Reaching the bottom of the stairs, Aminus and his friends saw a statue, and not like the statue above, the figure before them depicted a warrior from an epic poem, and upon further inspection, they realized the face was familiar. Too familiar. It can't be, said the Iberian couple. By the gods, exclaimed Semitocles. Aminus, what's happening? What do you see? asked Artaxerxes. Me, he said, and indeed it was. The statue of the warrior was indeed Aminus, but from another life. The figure wore a suit of armor and helmet and held a shield in his left hand. It wasn't very comforting because it was his father's shield, but it was pristine. Looking up at the statue, he saw it. Right before him was the sword. The sword wasn't like anything that existed now. It was a single-edged, one-handed blade that pitched forward towards the point, the edge being conclave on the part of the sword nearest the hilt, but swelling to convexity towards the tip. The handle was molded to resemble a male lion, with its head near the end of the handle. Aminus was mesmerized by its beauty as he walked towards it. Standing before the blade, he felt his heart racing. As he extended his hands toward it, he saw them shaking with anxiety. He stopped himself to gather his senses. Taking a few deep breaths, he reached for the sword. Here goes nothing, he said. As he grabbed the weapon, waves of blue energy flowed into his body, paralyzing him. Suddenly, visions flashed in his head. The intensity was so great that it sent Aminus flying backwards, releasing his grip on the sword. The others rushed to help, wondering if he was okay. Motioning them away, he got back to his feet. However, his body began to scream in pain, as if he was burning from the inside. Whatever the sword did to him, his body was suffering from the effects. Limping his way back, he grabbed the sword and pulled it at once. Soon, more blue energy flowed into him, coursing through his veins. As more visions emerged, he screamed, crying out, as he struggled to remove the blade, removing the sword from its imprisonment. Finally... With the last ounce of strength, the sword gave way. Pulling the sword from the statue, Aminus stumbled to the ground. As he lay on the floor, Aminus' eyes widened. He remembered everything. The gathering. His friends. The battle. Returning home. Changing time. He remembered everything. What have I done? And with that, viewers and listeners, we will end here. Now, we have reached it. Aminus has finally recovered his memories from the gathering. And now, with that knowledge, it's going to change the rest of the story and that of his friends. Because if you've been following the gathering story, you know what happens in history. With that knowledge in hand, how are the others going to react to it? And what has the blue energy done to him? Well, you have to find out next week and see what happens. As always, viewers and listeners, thank you so much for joining me for another audio reading. Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe down below. And I'll see you all in the next episode.